Thank you for joining tonight's webinar, Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition 201. I'm Joe Cortese, co-president of the Chicago Booth Alumni Club, and I'm also a principal and a senior consultant with DeMeo Schneider and Associates uh, here in Chicago. With me again this evening is Brian O'Connor. Brian's the founder of NextGen Growth Partners and also, as many of you are probably aware, an adjunct assistant professor of entrepreneurship at Booth. So for all of you that joined our first webinar uh, on entrepreneurship through acquisition, uh, titled 101, of course, recall, uh, we talked about the basics. What is ETA? We talked about the three different models of ETA. We talked about potential economics uh, and, a, and a, a, tr a tremendous amount of additional overview information on the subject. For those of you that are interested in uh, watching that replay, you'll find the link to the replay in the chat box. So feel free to copy that and take a look at the first version if you, if you weren't able to catch it. Um, in tonight's uh, ETA through 201 presentation, we'll dive deeper into the actual search process. So we'll talk about how to organize the search, how to build a target list, how to properly qualify prospects, things like that. And as we did last time, we'll be happy to take questions along the way. Uh, you should see the chat uh, option there, or the question and answer option, excuse me. And if you do have a question, by all means, please go ahead and type it into the question box and we'll do our best to take all the questions um, as we go throughout the presentation. So we're not gonna hold time at the end for questions. We'd rather keep it more conversational and take your questions as we go. Um, and also, uh, for those of you that are interested in more information about this topic, you can feel free to reach out to myself. You can feel free to reach out to Brian or, or, or NextGen, uh, Brian's firm. There'll be some uh, contact information available there as well. And finally, I'll just mention, uh, we'll have additional iterations uh, of this uh, webinar and this topic. The next one, ETA 301, will be probably in a month or so, and we'll dive deeper into how to actually value a, a prospective acquisition target, how to execute the transaction, those types of more sort of detailed nitty gritty information in subsequent webinars. So with that, let's dive in. Brian, wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate your time. Uh, let's get started with um, talking about the sort of the overview. How do, you, how do you think about organizing the search? What are some of the common steps you think about and kind of how, do you, how does this process all really begin? Uh, uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, nice to be here and uh, appreciate everybody dialing in and joining. Uh, Joe, it sounds like you just signed us up for 301, so we're just going to have to figure out who's actually going to do the, the content for 301 because that's that's above my pay grade. So we gotta, we got to figure that out between now and then. Uh, but listen, um, it's it's really cool to be doing this, and it's uh, great to connect with uh, so many booth alum that might be interested in the ETA path. So, Joe, thanks for uh, organizing this and, and putting it together. Um, and as Joe mentioned, let's let's do our best to kind of keep this conversational. So, if any of you are former students and have been in my uh, my class or uh, the class that Mark and I teach at Booth, uh, you'll know we like to keep it interactive and uh, as best we possibly can via. Uh, Zoom, we'd love to use the chat feature or anybody raise their hand at any point if you want to uh, dig into something. So, you know, Joe, to get to the question, I think the first step, honestly, in pursuing a path in entrepreneurship through acquisition is to really simply understand if it's the right path for you, okay? And the, the best way I've found to do that is to talk to Booth alum or other uh, folks in your network that have some familiarity with this space. Maybe they've raised a search fund. Maybe they've affiliated with a, a family office to buy and operate a business, or they've gone down one of the various paths that you can go down that we'll talk a little bit about. We spent a lot of time on that uh, in the first session, but, but really mobilize your network. And I would say there's a tremendous amount of resources available, you know, through Joe and the alumni network and through Polsky Center um, and through just this tight knit, seems like a very tight knit community of practitioners that have decided to go out and, and pursue uh, a, a career in buying and leading a small business or a series of uh, small or mid-sized businesses. So first step, honestly, is to, is to figure out if it's right for you. And the best way to do that is to have conversations with those that have have come before you. Second step, I would say, is if you uh, still have not been uh, convinced that the proposition is uh, too risky or too challenging or uh, too far outside of your comfort zone, which I trust 
all of you are extremely capable and uh, could do this uh, without too much of an issue, uh, you then really need to understand the paths that are available to you. And, and as Joe mentioned, we're not gonna spend too much time on that because we did cover that in our last session, but really we like to think about it in three different paths, right? There's the traditional search fund path that we talked about. There's this path whereby you can go about it by self-funding or doing it independently uh, with your own savings or your own capital to conduct a search. Uh, and then uh, ultimately at time of acquisition, uh, that would be when you would um, go and, and, and raise some capital and use your uh, investor network that you've established to fund that ultimate transaction. Or uh, the third path uh, that we spent some time talking about is this notion of a, a sponsored search, right? Affiliating yourself with a, uh, a, a firm or an outfit that has capital and, and resources to go put you in a position to ultimately go chase down and effectuate an acquisition that you would then uh, lead post acquisition as your uh, uh, entirety of your uh, professional uh, interest. Um, you know, I would say the next steps from there are really path specific, right? So uh, if you were to raise a search fund, at that point, you're probably gonna wanna start to have some conversations with would-be investors, people that are within your network and there's a pretty well-established community, both at Booth and, and otherwise, um, of investors that uh, have made a habit of investing in, in search funds and these types of lower and micro middle market uh, operator-led leverage buyouts, effectively many leverage buyouts with the operator as the uh, one effectuating uh, that transaction. So you'll you want to start to talk to those folks. And then if it is the search fund path that you're going on down, you'll also want to talk to an attorney and they're going to help you understand how to navigate the various uh, documentation that you're going to need to be uh, putting together. You're, you're probably going to want to put together a, a private placement memorandum, a PPM. Um, that's effectively the offering document that you go out uh, to those investors that you've been having conversations with. Uh, with the proposition of investing into your search fund and then ultimately with the proposition of uh, investing in the acquisition that you unearth. And, and, and so that would be uh, one path. And we're gonna get into some of this in our conversation, uh, but part of that PPM exercise is really refining your story and understanding your, uh, the thesis and the, and the targets that you're gonna go after and you know, where you think there's an interesting angle and an opportunity for you to, uh, to, to really find a, a good business that you'll ultimately lead and create value in post, uh, post investment. I'm see that uh, the next steps in the path for uh, self-funded or uh, independently funded uh, would be a little bit, um, uh, frankly, a little bit more nebulous, but uh, ultimately you are gonna wanna put together some material to communicate to prospective investors down the road uh, that when you are looking to fund the ultimate acquisition, you're going to at least have some warm relationships and uh, introductions uh, that have been made historically to uh, get them excited about the ultimate uh, investment that you're gonna pursue and, and acquire and lead. Uh, and then in the sponsored path, uh, I would say uh, networking with, with, groups like, with groups like ours, uh, you know, private equity funds that um, have made a habit of uh, backing entrepreneurs that are interested in pursuing the acquisition and leadership of a smaller mid-sized business. Um, so that would be, um, you know, really where you'd want to start to establish a line of communication, get to know the firm, uh, have them get to know you and determine if there's a fit and alignment between where you see opportunity, where you think um, you're going to focus your search efforts and the business and the industry that that business is in that you ultimately want to lead that lends itself well to your uh, background and skill set and, and professional interests. So, so true form, uh, we had another little internet glitch here. I apologize for that. <laughs> so hopefully you weren't waiting on me, but um, uh, I, I missed some of that, but we'll just continue on here. I apologize. Yeah, Joe, no, no, I, 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 I saw you drop real quick there, but I, I, I kept going and uh, good to have you back. I Excellent. We're, we're, we're two for two on uh, my internet dropping uh, these, these meetings. So I don't know who's, who's, uh, who's against us here, but we'll, we will prevail. Um, no Anyway, so let's um, th thank you for that. That's that's fantastic. I, I agree with everything you said there. I think I think what you said about, you know, understanding how it fits for you and those sorts of things are, are really good initial thoughts and, and step to, to make sure that, you know, this this could be something that would work for the potential entrepreneur. And, so, yeah, and, and, and listen, I, and just to kind of double click on that real quick, Joe, I mean, there's no right path in the same way that there's no right answer as it relates to the industry or the thesis that you pursue. I think it's, it's really a matter of what fits 
for you and your career goals and the type of business that you want to buy and how you want to fund it and the you know the stage in, in, at, at, at which you are in your career and all of these factors come into play that really help you determine which path is right for you ultimately how you're going to get this thing funded uh, if you're uh, soliciting outside uh, funding outside of your own uh, savings or any uh, capital that you might be putting to work um, and uh, again I'll, I'll sort of probably say this a few times in, in this conversation, there are no right answers. I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about some ideas and some frameworks uh, that'll hopefully make you or help you uh, make a better decision as it relates to what path you should so decide to choose um, and ultimately where, uh, what, what thesis you spend time trying to unearth targets in and the ultimate business that you uh, acquire and lead, but um, there are there are no right answers, right? Then there, there are a lot of available paths to- Yeah, I think, that, I think that's really- I think that's really important. There, there is no, you know, there, there is unlimited sort of ways to do this. But I think what you and your firm have done in, in terms of sort of institutionalizing this into a framework makes it much easier to understand and makes it, uh, you know, much easier to potentially execute. And, 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 you know, in our discussions talking about sort of the first step in the process in terms of like developing the thesis, uh, what, where, you know, you can't, you can't look at the entire world and, and and sort of digest potential targets that way how, so how do you how do you kind of formulate the, the the thesis what goes into that and how do you begin to sort of construct the funnel and then begin to narrow it down and, and, and think about yeah. you know, progressing through the process yeah this scenario that, that you outlined we we like to describe or use the analogy of like trying to boil the ocean right if you, if you try to boil the ocean you're probably not going to be too successful right so you really do, Joe, have to have to pick your spots. And I think that's what you're referring to when you talk about develop your thesis, okay? So I, I think, frankly, um, we're all booth trained. Uh, and so we're not strangers to the notion of economic research, right? So you probably wanna start somewhere where there is good economic opportunity. And, and we can talk a little bit about what that means to me, but that's probably going to mean different things to different people. I like uh, industries that are growing as opposed to languishing. I like industries that have uh, a high degree of fragmentation such that there isn't one 800 pound gorilla that, uh, you know, dominates the market and has some enormous uh, economies of scale and can frankly, you know, put all the smaller fragmented players out of business. And, and frankly, when you have fragmentation in the market, chances are some of those fragmented players are going to be the, in the right size range um, for uh, you to buy because you're not very unlikely that you would buy uh, an extremely large enterprise in pursuing the ETA path. I like... Uh, to, to focus on theses that revolve around industries that are uh, non-cyclical. Uh, you know, we're living through a pretty tough time right now during COVID. And so a good way to look at, you know, what might be a durable thesis or industry during a time of tough economic times or uh, during, you know, a, a, a global pandemic that we're living through is, to evaluate how that business has performed during the second quarter of 2020 once we get those results finalized, right? So I, I, I tend to focus on uh, places that are growing, so have some economic tailwind behind them, are sufficiently fragmented such that uh, you're not competing with the 800 pound gorilla and you do have a viable set of targets in that industry. I like to focus on industries that aren't so tiny, or and I, I describe them really as niches because saying an industry is probably too generic and that probably leads you to boiling the ocean a little bit. I think that saying that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at opportunities in healthcare, I think would be akin to trying to boil the ocean. I think you really need to be more refined about your thesis development. So, um, but, but not so refined that you're really limiting your audience of potential targets to two or three players and neither of them want to engage with you about the potential sale of their business. So it's a little bit of a finding the, the, the sweet spot. And I like to think about, you know, TAM, total addressable market. Um, and a, a good TAM I often uh, guide is, you know, sort of a, a billion dollars in annual revenue available to that kind of little market niche that, that tends to be pretty good. You can obviously go up from there and you know, slightly below, but that's a, kind of a good rule of thumb. But all of, I, I tend to, getting, getting back to your original question, Scott, or, uh, Joe, I, I, I tend to think that it's really 
research and economic driven and frankly fit with entrepreneur. Like if I'm a searcher, um, I'm probably not gonna be compelled uh, to go out and pursue an acquisition of a life sciences business that requires me to have a PhD uh, to operate that business, something that's highly technical. So I like to think about theses that play in spaces that have relatively low operational complexity, such that you know a Booth alum that's a very talented business athlete but does not have that highly uh, specialized degree in, in, in life sciences or whatever the case might be, is able to step in and with a period of time and a, and a learning curve, get up to speed and be able to operate a business within that, uh, within that industry. Just those, those are a few thoughts. I mean, there are a number of other ones around industry profitability, um, uh, durability. I mentioned, you know, non-cyclicality, those types of things. And, and, and the list sort of goes on. But again, to start your thesis driven by economic factors and those factors that mesh well uh, with your background is, is a pretty darn good start uh, to form a couple. I, I often encourage uh, searchers going down this path to sort of pick, you know, call it three spaces that are maybe related, maybe, maybe not, but that uh, would make good spaces for you to research, get smart on, um, develop your target list, and then go after and pursue uh, for an ultimate acquisition. Sounds great. Yeah, uh, that, that's great insight. I've got a couple questions here, and some folks may not be aware of your background, but um, John asks, uh, you know, asks about, you know, did you complete a relatively small acquisition, and how long did it take, and money invested in those sorts of things. So maybe a good case study of that would be kind of your experience thus far. Yeah. I'll briefly recap that for us. Yeah, yeah. I'll, like, I'll be super brief about it, because uh, I don't want to put anybody to sleep on the call, but um, I, 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 my, I sort of my formal early career training was in uh, M&A and private equity and uh, got my MBA at Booth along the way. And um, in 2010, I uh, raised a search fund and, and ultimately uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but I ended up finding uh, a really great uh, IT services business, uh, a, a company that provided a mission critical recurring revenue. We talk a lot about when we talk about industry attributes and, and business attributes, uh, which are, are decidedly different things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We talk a lot about recurring revenue. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, does this company provide a mission critical uh, recurring revenue service? We often favor in the ETA model B2B over B2C. Uh, B2B tend to be stickier uh, relationships that are, you know, we as consumers, Joe, tend to be a little bit fickle, uh, <laughs> are, are, are subject to changing trends and fads and that type of thing. So, you know, back to the sort of story, in 2010, uh, raised a search fund, um, searched um, high and low for, for companies, ended up finding this uh, great little IT services company uh, that provided a mission critical recurring uh, revenue outsourced B2B service. So uh, the easiest way I describe it is um, if, if you ever, uh, uh, back when people used to travel and stay at hotels, if you stayed at a Marriott property nationwide, chances are uh, when you brought your, your smartphone or your laptop, you were logging on to and using uh, the Wi-Fi infrastructure and the managed services, the managed IT services that were in the four walls of that hotel. And that was the responsibility uh, of the company that I bought in 2011 after nine months of searching. So yeah, small business at, at, at time of acquisition, sort of right in the zone of where these typical uh, acquisitions tend to be, call it, you know, uh, two million, one and a half, two million dollars in EBITDA to, you know, kind of five range. You definitely see some that are below that range. You see some that are above that range, it's sort of two to five million in EBITDA mission critical B2B service. Um, and yes, out of the search fund that I raised in 2010, uh, effectuated the acquisition of that business in uh, nine months later in mid 2011. So that's a great segue to the next question. Ann Kitts asks, Ann Kitts, excuse me, asks, how should I approach conv convincing investors who are not aware of a search fund concept? So how did you, as someone that, you know, had never done this, how are you able to, uh, you know, introduce this concept to folks and convince them that uh, they should invest with you? Yeah, you know, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, you do get a lot of, uh, you know, looks from those folks that aren't maybe familiar with this type of investing, like, you're, you're trying to tell me that you want to do what? <laughs> and you don't, you don't have a target in mind, and you've never been a CEO, how do you think you're going to operate a business? Listen, 
Um, and, and frankly, some of those questions are, are legitimate. And until we find ourselves in the seat of, you know, searching for an, a, a business to ultimately acquire or operating, it is a little bit of a, a, a crazy concept, frankly. But uh, th this model was born uh, back in the mid 80s out of Stanford GSP. Um, when the professor that sort of founded this model backed a promising uh, student or graduate of their class and ultimately this asset class around search funds and entrepreneurship through acquisition was born and frankly an investment community has formed uh, around this asset class and this notion and it's a pretty well publicized uh, network of people that understand uh, the nuances associated with raising capital uh, for a search and then ultimately uh, for an acquisition for you, Joe, or whomever else to go occupy the CEO seat uh, in a transition plan, very likely, um, uh, of, a, of a smaller mid-sized enterprise. So listen, how do, you, how do you go about convincing them? You know, you need to convince them that, that your heart is in it. Uh, you need to convince them that um, you're uh, doing this because you, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons, which I think are because you really want to operate a small business, right? It's, it's, it's not always uh, easy. It's certainly not always easy. It's definitely not always glamorous uh, to run a, a two, three, four million dollar EBITDA company. But if, if you're an, you know, an entrepreneurial spirit and uh, you do want to roll up your sleeves and operate and you have sound rationale as it relates to your motivations and how those are going to align well with your background and ultimately the thesis that you're developing. Um, the, the right audience of investors, uh, there's a, a, again, a pretty established network that, uh, that, that is uh, you know, at Booth and, and elsewhere uh, that have been compelled to uh, back these endeavors, my, my, myself, myself included. So um, it's, uh, you know, and then I guess the last thing I'll say on it is um, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, conviction and hard work and hustle that needs to be portrayed in this thing. And, and again, a commitment, I like to call some of the ideal uh, would-be searchers that um, uh, we, we end up meeting and having discussions with. I like to call them the, the, the best ones that we meet are part of the 4-H club. And the 4-H's stand for heart, hunger, hustle, and humility. And uh, it tends to be the case that when you marry uh, a booth uh, graduate, with the four H's and a sound thesis and a process oriented approach toward what industries you're going to focus on and how you're going to find targets and what you want to do with those businesses uh, post investment. Um, the investment community is, is there uh, and ready to support you financially in your, in your effort. Got it. That's great. So um, let's talk a little bit about just, you know, developing the thesis. I mean, I'm sure it's a range, but kind of, how long does it take from, you know, sort of concept to figuring out, okay, these are the industries that I'm going to target. And then also along those lines, what are some of the, 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 the tips you have to ensure that you're not pursuing something that ultimately isn't going to pan out? How can you be sure that you're going down the right path? Yeah. So I, how long does it take? I mean, listen, uh, research is an exercise that can take two minutes or two years, right? So, so I caution really smart, talented Booth alum that are on this call to not get into a situation of analysis paralysis. I think that's honestly the worst thing that you can do. I think you need to identify, build yourself a scorecard. Build a scorecard of the industry attributes and associated weightings of importance to you in your search that you're looking for when developing a thesis. Maybe it's industry growth rate, it's fragmentation, it's non-cyclicality, it's profitability of the average set of players in that industry, right? What are the important things that matter to you? And then, you know, use some of the research resources that are available to you through, you know, booth subscriptions or otherwise to get smart on those spaces pretty quickly, but then, don't sit behind an Excel spreadsheet for too long. Get out in the field, go to, a, go to a trade show, start talking to business owners that operate companies in this space and pretty quickly, you're gonna find that either your thesis is validated by these conversations that you're having out in the market or you're, you're, you're gonna maybe wanna pivot pretty quickly. Um, and I just, I would say that, you know, um, don't, don't get analysis paralysis, uh, get out and, and ask your thesis early. Talk to your investor, right? This is one thing that I think 
early career searchers have a tendency to do. They, they operate in a, in a little bit of a black box and they sort of get into an echo chamber and think they've got this great idea and they're, you know, smart. So they're validating it and all this. And, but like, listen, if that doesn't align well with your investors that presumably have really good pattern recognition and have seen good and bad industries and good and bad businesses, uh, you know, many times over, um, there, you know, that, that's valuable input. And ultimately that's probably something that you're going to want to pivot from pretty quickly. So I would say, you know, keep the idea mill full, execute on it uh, without spending too much time getting bogged down in the analysis because you're going to test and refine your thesis over time as you're out sourcing targets and having conversations and talking to intermediaries and industry experts and river guides and all these great things we talked about on our, on our last call. Um, and, and you got to go and you got to, you know, real time pivot and go on a in a tangent to that thesis that you thought was going to yield a lot of good results or frankly you might test it over the course of a couple weeks and you scrap it all together because time when you're doing this you'll find is your most scarce resource you, you absolutely uh, tend to be funded with a period of time in mind usually that's about two years is, is typically how a, a, a searcher a, someone that's pursuing an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneurship through acquisition path would probably think about giving themselves about two years of runway, which might sound like a long time, but, but trust me, it, it flies by really quickly and you need to turn through a lot of uh, industries, ideas, theses uh, probably, but, but definitely targets to find uh, the right business and with the right owner that actually wants to transact and, and sell you uh, their, their business. Got it. Yeah, and uh, that's also another great segue. Uh, we've got a question from Ben. I think about Ben's in one of your classes here, uh, maybe currently, but just asking about, you know, what are some of the things that derail this process? You know, it seems like um, in some cases, you know, folks can go down this path and decide that it doesn't work for them. And can you just talk a little bit about some of the challenges that arise, perhaps so people can, can be aware of them up front and, you know, kind of what can cause people to abandon this, this, this type of a endeavor? Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are a few things. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll cite two of them, and I've got a couple of anecdotes that I can um, share a little bit later on in our conversation. But, but um, one would be related to what we just talked about. I, I often find in um, some uh, search funds that I've invested in or, um, you know, uh, former students that, that go down this path and, you know, are a year into it and they find that their pipeline isn't taking form in the, in the way um, that, that they'd like it to. They don't have uh, that many prospects or that many uh, leads that they're ultimately working toward an indication of interest or a letter of intent. And, and I ask the questions of them about what did the early days of your search effort look like? Did it look like spending a lot of time in Cap IQ or Ibis World and behind an Excel spreadsheet trying to hone your industry thesis to be just right? Or was it being out? And again, back, you know, four months ago when it was okay to attend trade shows and meet business owners. We'll there again eventually. Yeah, let's, let, 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 let's sort of like, you know, flash back a little bit. Um, you know, it, it really is those folks that had a hard time getting out of their comfort zone and executing and taking a bias to action approach and showing up to the trade show when that maybe was uncomfortable or they didn't feel like they were prepared to do so or take, taking the call with a business owner uh, before doing all of the requisite, you know, research and analysis on their industry um, and, and maybe you, you stumble and maybe you learn, you, you learn a thing or two about something you did or something you might want to change in your next approach. I found that the folks that tend to sit on their hands and uh, not get out in front of business owners and have conversations, get out in the market, building their pipeline early, they find that later in their search because these opportunities tend to have long gestation periods between initial point of contact and when you ultimately transact with a business owner. So those folks that sat on their hands, uh, you know, for, for months in the beginning uh, tend to struggle toward the latter stages of their search. The other thing I would mention um, is that uh, it's critically important uh, because there is 
so much, there, there is unfortunately some luck in, in what we're talking about doing here. And at any time, a deal can fall apart. I've found that uh, some folks can uh, get tunnel vision on a particular target once they maybe get it under LOI. And letter of intent is basically uh, uh, a non-binding agreement between a buyer and seller under which the terms are that, that you're gonna ultimately uh, purchase their, their business, hopefully you know, 60 or 90 days later as you perform diligence. Um, the, the, uh, the folks that while they're doing that and while they're getting an opportunity under letter of intent, and advancing and diligencing on that opportunity to take their eye off the ball as it relates to continued pursuit of their theses that they've been pursuing and continued outreach and dialogue with other potential targets in their pipeline. And listen, it, it happens that these transactions fall apart as you're working them in an exclusive uh, uh, an, an exclusivity period in, a, in an LOI, they fall apart. And those folks that haven't been mindful of continuing to keep their pipeline full of opportunities find themselves 30, 60, 90, potentially more days down the road flat-footed in the event that that deal falls apart. So the second piece is, is the folks that um, maybe take their eye off the ball uh, on keeping their pipeline full. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned, you know, your preference for higher growth industries. You did get a question about, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure folks prefer higher growth industries, but have you seen this model be successful in industries that aren't growing as fast or maybe languishing? Does Can that work? Um, I think it can work. I, I, I just... Um, you know, I would. I, I, there are some industries that I that I avoid that I that I believe to be sort of languishing or overly cyclical or troubled for one reason or another. And and, and I, I would encourage people to sort of have their do not touch list. Uh, and that's probably different for for everyone. Um, you know, businesses. I'm, I'm sorry, industries that are steady eddy. They've you know kind of been growing at GDP over the years. I, listen, I think you can find interesting opportunities in those industries and perhaps they're less competitive. Therefore, you're going to be able to structure yourself a, a, a better deal for the purchase of the business that you ultimately find in that industry. Um, so I, I, I think that's, uh, that's a fine and fair approach. I just like to talk about stacking the deck in your favor. And one of those ways you can stack the deck in your favor is to, you know, uh, buy a ship in a, in a sea that has rising tides. You know, everybody's uh, going to be lifted a little bit. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it would be, uh, uh, you know, not crazy to think about finding a business in just a stable industry that you uh, uh, buy at a, an attractive price and you do things uh, to that business. I would, I would encourage you not to be naive about the assumptions that you make around taking an industry and a business that's been growing in line with that GDP industry and sort of immediately being able to turn that into a GDP times two or GDP times three grower. I think that that's a, a, a little bit of a naive view on it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, you certainly it's, it's not crazy to think that you might find a good business in, a, in an industry that hasn't been uh, growing as much as some others. Maybe the way to think about it is uh, businesses and industries that aren't growing as fast just have less margin for error potentially. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's well said, Joe. Um, one of the other questions that we got here, uh, just on the international market, do you, do you see this model internationally? Do you see an interest in this type of a, of a model overseas? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, Mark and I have students um, uh, every time we teach uh, that, that uh, come you know, from international uh, locations and bring these concepts and these tools back to their uh, home countries and have been very, very effective. You've seen uh, quite a bit of it uh, from Booth alum and, and otherwise in, in Latin America. Uh, there are several Booth alum that have pursued it in, uh, in, in Mexico and Brazil and some other Latin American countries. Um, there's a, 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 a developed um, kind of ecosystem for this in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, and I would say it's, it's starting. We've seen a little bit uh, in Asia, but, but probably not as much as what we've seen. Uh, you know, the, historically, the, the, you know, the concentration has been in the, in the US, uh, but you have seen some in, in Canada, some in LabPAM, some in uh, Western Europe. Um, and I think it's, it's continuing to grow in awareness and popularity.
Got it. I want to uh, switch gears a little bit. And we talked about, you know, how do you sort of get the thesis going and, and, and get and, and get and get the process started. Let's say you've got your thesis, you've got your industry, you know, one or two sort of targeted. How do you then begin to build your target list of prospective uh, acquisitions? Yeah. Um, if anybody has like the silver bullet answer for this question, like please call me after this because uh, that's a very valuable answer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I'll say, Joe, is you, you got to use the tools and resources that are available to you and you got to get scrappy about it. So one of the things we talk about in class, I'll just give you a couple of anecdotes. Like, you know, you find the industry trade organization for the particular niche that you're chasing down and, and you, uh, you, you, you try to attend the trade show or if you can't make it to the trade show or if COVID happens and there is no trade show, you get, you get the trade show exhibitor list and you research all thousand companies that last year exhibited at that trade show because very likely those are probably pretty uh, appropriately sized businesses for what you might be looking for. And they're, they're obviously exhibiting their products or services at, at the trade show. So they're going to be uh, very likely relevant targets. So, um, you know, you, there, there are online uh, databases and subscriptions and uh, things that you could sign up for. But frankly, at the end of the day, it's a lot of hustle. It's being scrappy. It's being resourceful. It's developing lists. It's, you know, uh, often you'll find uh, people that pursue the ETA path or leveraging um, the help from uh, interns because interns tend to you know do a lot of a lot of research and help the uh, ETA practitioner uh, you know develop target lists and uh, vet through those lists and identify whether or not a target is going to be worth pursuing sort of thing. So uh, at the end of the day, I think it's it, it is a numbers game in this path, and so you got to develop that that list of two, three, four hundred targets that you think might be in the size range and in the business model type that you're looking for. And then you, and then you go out and you, you campaign them and you try to, in whatever way you can, uh, uh, get a conversation going and develop a relationship um, with, uh, with the business owner. So that's, that's great. And the question always comes up when, you, when, when we start to talk about this is, do intermediaries work? Is that, is that part of this process that can be effective? So talk a little bit about yeah. you know, the intermediaries, how you think about that, and you know, what, do you see a lot of, of, of transactions that take place involving inter, in, intermediaries? Yeah, in this? yeah I, I, I figured that was gonna be uh, the next question here. It, it's a natural next question. And the answer is, the answer is yes. I mean, I think that um, you know, the, the approach that we've been talking about thus far is one that is often described as proprietary, right? So there's this proprietary path toward sourcing, which is develop a thesis, go out and campaign, form a relationship directly with a business owner, and avoid participating in a competitive process that's run by an investment bank or a, or a broker right? There's this whole other path that is intermediated and, and uh, banker or broker driven. And to answer your question directly, Joe, yes, transactions in ETA happen all the time um, with, a, with a broker involved. I mean, I think that, that the trade-off, right, is that you're probably not the only person looking at that opportunity. So you've got the opportunity to sort of get into a winner's curse scenario. And, uh, you know, you, often when there's competition, that drives up price. And so, you know, I often uh, encourage uh, ETA, people that follow the ETA path to, you know, not necessarily be inclined to be the highest bidder in an auction process to, to win a business. You need to appeal to a seller for sometimes reasons that are non-economic. You know, you're going to be the long lost son or daughter of that business to carry the torch forward and preserve their legacy. That, that's a meaningful component of why a business owner might be compelled to sell to you versus uh, someone else that might be willing to offer them more cash at close or more uh, enterprise value for their, for their business. So um, yes, there absolutely is uh, a universe of bankers and brokers and wealth advisors and accountants and attorneys and, and people that have access to these deals. Um, and listen, the reality is, is all bankers and brokers are not created equally. So there is a component of finding that business that is misrepresented or un 
under marketed let's let's put it by a, a broker and and frankly that might present a, an opportunity to buy a business that otherwise should have been valued at something much higher than than where you purchased it so and the nice thing frankly about the intermediated channel versus the proprietary channel is you know that you've got a willing seller on the end of other end of the telephone right they've engaged a broker not to uh, sit around and do nothing they've engaged a broker to Try to find them a universe of buyers that will ultimately be the right buyer and the right fit and the right price and the right structure and all those sorts of things, um, you know, uh, for, for their business. So, yes, it happens often. Um, and I encourage searchers to uh, not be exclusive in one path or the other. I think a well-managed pipeline, well-managed deal flow comes from uh, various different sources, both in proprietary, thesis-driven, as well as uh, intermediate. And so as you're forming this, you know, prospective list of companies to acquire, are there characteristics that, that make um, prospective businesses super attractive? And on the flip side of that, are there, you know, a few characteristics that make them really unattractive so that you can kind of get a quick sense of, okay, this is something I really should spend some time on or I need to run away. This is a dumpster fire. Yeah, for sure. I mean, some of it is going to be easy for me to talk about generically, but then some of it is very much company specific and you need to get a look at the financials and the team that's incumbent and, you know, all the, some of the nuances associated with that particular business. But some of the things that are more generic, right? Like I tend to favor businesses that have recurring revenue streams. So we talked a little bit about recurring revenue on the last call, but you know, when you have a relationship with a customer that month in and month out, unless they take action to stop their subscription to your service, uh, it's going to predictably and reliably produce the same amount of revenue the following month, the following year, unless you as the service provider screw something up. Those are fantastic businesses because you don't have to wake up every morning and think about where your first dollar of revenue for that particular day uh, is going to come from. I, you know, I tend to favor and encourage uh, people following this path to favor, you know, mission critical, uh, low share of customer wallet, um, business services, right? So let's take the environment that we're in right now. If you provide on behalf of a Fortune 1000 company, if you are a, a component of their compliance function and they need you, you and your subject matter expertise to exist um, and times get tough and they need to think about cutting expenses, you know, is it the compliance service provider that they pay a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month to have this nuanced little thing uh, humming within their organization, that's probably not the thing that's going to get cut, right? So that check that you continue to receive is very likely to uh, very likely to remain intact in good times and in bad. So, you know, I think about these mission critical asset light recurring revenue B2B service models as kind of the darlings of the ETA path for, for good reason. Those are really good companies and then you know once you get a peek under the hood of the business you you know you're obviously looking at things like historical growth you want to buy a business that's growing not languishing and and you know you want to buy a business with enough breathing room in the PL. so healthy EBITDA and free cash flow margins and you know ideally you've got a, a, a business that generate you know has a scenario whereby it's a negative networking capital business so as you grow you, you can use uh, working capital to fund your growth. That's a, a really cool element of, of businesses, right? So there's a lot of nuances um, to what does or doesn't make a business attractive. But the last thing I'll sort of say on this, unless we've got questions or want to get deeper into it, is no business is perfect, <laughs> okay? Especially a business that generates two, three, four million dollars of, of annual EBITDA, right? These are small businesses. None of the businesses are going to be completely without, you know, customer concentration or completely without uh, a deficiency in a particular part of their organization. Um, none of them are going to have a particular, like a, a, a perfectly linear growth path and illustrate, you know, perfect operating leverage in the model such that every year that they grow, their EBITDA margins expand. These are all great things that we look for, but just be mindful uh, of not letting perfection get in the way of progress and momentum because nothing is perfect 
uh, in this world, but certainly not, not perfect in, in this micro part of the middle market. If, if they were perfect, they probably wouldn't be for sale, right? <laughs> uh, it's, and, and along these lines, an interesting question from Tucker. Uh, as you develop your thesis, how much do you bank on being able to create incremental value post acquisition? Or said differently, like, is there a certain threshold of value add that you think is important before you would actually look at transacting? Yeah, so great question. Um, yeah, you need to absolutely have a thesis around what you want to do with this business. But, but what I'll say before I get into that a little bit is remember, um, core to this model and the success that's uh, existed in this model since the mid 80s and the success has, has been uh, wild in this uh, asset class and, and, and model um, is you're buying fundamentally sound businesses in healthy markets. So first order of business, when you buy a business at four, five, six times trailing 12 months EBITDA, which is a good, a good value for these types of companies that we just talked about illustrate you know, characteristics of recurring revenue and healthy margins and growth and all these things. Um, don't try to fix what isn't broken. <laughs> You've bought a business for a good reason at a really good price and there's a reason why you've been attracted to that business at the purchase price that you bought it for. Take a minute. It's, it's so easy for all of us as Booth alum to want to get in there and flex our MBA muscles and start to make changes and use all the playbooks and the things that we learned at Booth. But honestly, there's so much value in taking a step back, observing, learning the business, getting super familiar with the uh, the, the cash inflows and outflows of the business, meeting the spending tremendous amounts of team uh, amount, amounts of time with your your team, your you know frontline people that are out delivering the service or making the product or um, you know caring for for the organization and your customers. Right, there's tremendous amounts of learning when you you go and have customer concentrations that sort of thing. So yes, absolutely, you're going to have a value creation plan and. Part of the beautiful thing about these businesses is often they are underutilized and can benefit from a really talented, uh, you know, booth minted, highly trained uh, professional coming in and bringing new ideas and institutionalization and systems and technology and additional talent and all these great things. Um, but let's not try to fix what isn't broken uh, early on. There's a learning period advice. Um, so uh, zooming out for a second back to sort of um, putting the fund or the syndicate together. John asks, how many initial investors are optimum? Um, and do you find a, is there a sort of a, 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 a frequent minimum that people are interested in in this type of a model? Yeah, yeah. So John, good question. And, it, and it, it, it's path dependent, right? So search fund, you know, typically um, for your search capital, the initial tranche of capital that you raise, you might raise that from, you know, 10 or 15 investors that take a ratable share of your search capital that you're raising and then have the pro rata right to participate in the equity associated with the ultimate acquisition that you find. Um, in a, in a self-funded model, you don't raise any outside capital in the beginning. And then when you ultimately find the acquisition that requires five, $10 million in equity to get the deal done. You've hopefully developed the relationships that you go to a stable of investors that have expressed interest in wanting to know about the deals that you unearth and, and ultimately participating when you find them. And so there's no right answer there. I mean, if you um, were to, you know, require a $10 million equity check to get the deal done and that came from, you know, 10 people and there's an institution in there, there's a family office in there, there's a few advisors that are high net worth or ultra, ultra high net worth that may form uh, your board of directors post X, you know, that, that, that feels kind of about right for, you know, you go down the, uh, the, the sponsored search model and you have uh, a smaller concentrated group of investors in a private equity fund and maybe some co-investors and some advisors that participate alongside it. So there's no right answer there, but um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense for, how it, how it typically works. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, interesting question from Chaz. What if you already have a target in mind? So let's say you've got a business that you want to buy. I mean, do, do, you, do you think it's then worthwhile to go back and do the whole industry thesis work and, and, and sort of re-underwrite your, your interest in this business? Or kind of how would you think about that? 
Yeah, no, I think it's a good idea to, uh, I'll give you my phone number and you can give me a call. Uh, <laughs> good, good businesses are, are, are hard to find, right? Um, no, I, I think, um, listen, if you've got a target, um, you're going to want to tell the story about that target to whomever um, you're going to you know, bring into your opportunity and ultimately partner with uh, for the equity requirement. And part of that story is like the thesis, right? Why do we want to buy this business in this particular industry with this growth rate at this price and this structure and this amount of equity and this amount of debt and all? So it's, it's all part of a package that is going to help you as the entrepreneur understand what you're getting yourself into and your investors um, that are that are probably going to have a lot of questions around industry and and specific to the company and you know what's the you know to the earlier question like what's the growth plan you know uh, how are we structuring this thing what's the valuation all these sorts of things form your investment package and sometimes that's uh, conveyed to an investor group in a you know an offering memorandum or or whatever uh, but yeah it's it's all I would say important when evaluating the attractiveness or not of a, uh, of, a of a deal that you might have in hand. So we've got just about five minutes left here. I thought maybe in the last couple minutes, um, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, take us through a recent search that you've heard about or seen or something in your firm um, and kind of talk about maybe like what was the industry, what made it attractive and if it led to an, uh, acqu an acquisition, you know, that'd be great too if you could talk about sort of a live example that you've seen recently. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you one that's near and dear to me. It's um, uh, one that we, we, we did at our firm at Next Gen Growth Partners. Um, it started with an entrepreneur in residence um, that, was, that happened to be a Booth grad. Um, uh, he had a particularly interesting thesis that was related uh, to his background. So uh, he got some formal training as a, uh, a consultant and had some really good early career experience and then got some industry operating experience in the, uh, in the beverage alcohol space. So uh, he ran uh, operations for a wine distribution and retailing outfit. And in his free time, he also happened to be a sommelier, which was just sort of a, uh, so he was personally interested in, the, in this industry uh, as well. Um, uh, he came to, to me and, and, and to our firm with uh, the thought of putting together a thesis whereby we would target mission critical compliance, regulatory and importation services on behalf of beverage alcohol producers. So as we all know, uh, there's this age old since prohibition, highly complicated, highly bureaucratic, three tiered alcohol distribution system here in the US. Uh, God bless it because it's created the need for service providers that help producers uh, globally uh, navigate, require those producers uh, to have a partner that helps them navigate the complexities associated with getting their products across borders, out onto shelves and into consumers' hands, right? So there's this whole complex system, right? And there's an industry uh, that serves the, the producers of, of beverage alcohol. So we developed a thesis, it was a very specific and refined thesis. Um, he leveraged uh, some of his network connections, did a lot of primary research, did a lot of the scrappy things that we talked about, a lot of the web searching, a lot of the attending of trade shows and just meeting a lot of people uh, and ultimately, found a, a really great business that in the mid 90s was spun out of PepsiCo. Uh, Pepsi uh, in the mid 90s was divesting non-core, non-soft drink related assets. And the gentleman who headed up that division led a small kind of carve out, a small MBO of that division of Pepsi that handled compliance and regulatory and importation services for producers of beer, wine, and spirits. Uh, and so effectively that was the uh, the owner, the, the, the entrepreneur that we developed a relationship with. And, and frankly, this entrepreneur that uh, we, we, we partnered with and is still a partner in running the business is positioned himself as like the, the long lost partner uh, for this business owner that would be the next chapter and the succession plan ultimately for the principal shareholder as he got 
you know, a little bit later in his career and might be contemplating, you know, retirement or frankly was just drawn to the notion that a relatively early career super hungry hustler could come in and create all these, you know, uh, exciting opportunities for the business that, you know, the seller was the first to admit like, hey, listen, I've neglected some of these things. And so to have some fresh energy and some fresh blood into the organization to focus on these things would be tremendous. So uh, not in all cases, but in this case, it made sense for the selling shareholder to remain involved, both economically and operationally. Um, so they rolled some equity. Uh, they have a minority stake in the go forward business. And so there's nice alignment in the uh, in the capital structure with this person. And they've got a really cool opportunity to take a second bite at the apple. And the, the reason that we ultimately turned this individual into a seller, they weren't inclined to sell until we got them compelled about the entrepreneur that was going to be joining the organization and that they could roll a portion of equity that would ultimately, uh, based on our plan, turn into more economic value for them than the you know, sale price that we were buying the business for at time of acquisition. So really cool um, kind of marriage between, you know, this industry focus whereby it's, you know, growing, mission critical, large enough TAM. The business had a lot of the characteristics that we talked about, recurring revenue, super high margin, history of profitability and growth, mission critical. Um, and you had this really cool angle whereby the entrepreneur leveraged their strengths and some of their early career operating experience to create a compelling story that was very attractive to a business owner and ultimately led to the, uh, the, the, the transaction that was uh, consummated. Excellent. That's, that's fantastic. Well, it's uh, just about seven o'clock on the dot. So uh, great job on uh, getting right, getting us right to the top of the hour there. Uh, once again, that hour went by very, very quickly. We got a few questions that we didn't get to. Sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, but for those of you uh, who had questions that we weren't able to answer, I would encourage you to reach out, reach out. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with Brian on LinkedIn. I think our contact information is available as well. So um, certainly be happy to make sure you get to the, to Brian and his firm to, to get any additional questions answered that you, you might have. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 so real quick, Joe, yeah, just to uh, verify that that is true. Yes, please like reach out anytime. I would love to hear from folks that are interested or didn't get a question answered or might be compelled to pursue this path. I'd love to hear from you. Happy to be a resource. My uh, contact information is available on the uh, Booth faculty portal and uh, on our firm's website, nextgengp.com. Um, so reach out, um, happy to be a resource and you've got a lot of resources available to you uh, as Booth alum as you think about potentially pursuing uh, the ETA path. So uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from any and all. That's fantastic. Brian, thank you again so much. Really appreciate you taking some time. Um, for everybody that's on the call, remember, we will be doing uh, a couple more of these. So look for information on ETA 301, where we'll dive deeper into maybe some valuation metrics and, and actual transacting and some of the nitty gritty, which I know all Booth alumni will really love. So uh, again, Brian, thank you so much. Great to see you again. Really appreciate everyone that joined the, the meeting tonight. And we'll look forward to the next one here in about a month or so. Have a wonderful day.